Welcome back to the Denison Forum podcast. I'm Dr. Mark Terman, your host and executive director of Denison Forum. We appreciate you joining us for this conversation, for every conversation that we have here on the Denison Forum podcast about truth, about culture, about the intersection of faith and what's going on in our world today, answering hopefully questions that you have. Here in the fall, we're dealing with some of those issues that maybe you and your family may be encountering as kids go back to school, as college students start off into a new semester. Uh, those things about where uh, faith intersect with education, where they intersect with things like science and math and history. We're having those kinds of conversations today. And our guest today will be Dr. Jonathan Witt, who is the executive editor of Discovery Institute Press and a senior fellow and a senior project manager with Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. He is the author of a number of books, including The Hobbit Party, The Vision of Freedom That Tolkien Got and The West Forgot. That was written with Jay Richards. He is also the lead writer and associate producer of a documentary called Poverty, Inc., which was the $100,000 Templeton Freedom Award recipient and has also been viewed and awarded 50 international festival honors. He additionally scripted three other documentaries that have aired widely on PBS and have been translated into multiple languages airing around the world. Witt's academic essays have appeared in various periodicals, and he's been interviewed numerous times in both regional and national radio programs. He's a regular speaker for Discovery Institute's Summer Seminar on Science and Culture, and has spoken at a number of universities on a range of topics connected to political and economic freedom, cultural renewal, and the arts. Witt previously served as a tenured professor of literature and writing at Lubbock Christian University. He holds a PhD with honors in English and literary theory from the University of Kansas. Today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Witt about his book, A Meaningful World, How the Arts and Sciences Reveal the Genius of Nature. This book was written with Benjamin Whitaker and or Benjamin Weicker and gives an incredible insight into how the magnificence of uh, our world and uh, our pursuits academically point to uh, this this reality of genius, which ultimately points back to the ultimate genius of God. So we're excited for you to be a part of this conversation today. Thanks for joining us. Dr. Jonathan Witt, welcome to the Denison Forum podcast. We're glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Well, we got a, a lot of ground to cover. And just to remind our audience, uh, we've been focused on uh, educational type topics here in this season of the year as people go back to school, as college students, high school students, all across the ages, uh, getting back into their classrooms, getting their textbooks, getting their assignments, uh, firing up their computers, getting ready for uh, what all of this school year is going to mean, both academically and socially. And uh, so we wanted to talk to Dr. Witt and some others about uh, how things like science and faith, and today, science, art, and faith, uh, how those things are intertwined and how they intersect. And so as we get into that, uh, Dr. Witt wanted to see if you just tell us a little bit about your own journey of faith and uh, how that worked out and then how you ended up doing what you do now at the Discovery Institute. Uh, great question. I, I sometimes joke that I, I get can get testimony envy uh, because uh, you know there are these you know beautiful dramatic you know Paul on the road to Damascus testimonials. Uh, I was raised uh, in the church, and uh, as a you know kid, I, there was never some moment when I thought, "Oh, I'm, I'm an atheist, or I'm going to run away from God." Uh, I did have. Uh, a period where I became, you know, acutely aware of my sinfulness. Uh, I would say as I grew, it was for me. It was more getting a stronger sense of God's grace. Uh, uh, that was key for me in terms of um, intellect, uh, the intellectual part of the journey. I uh, one thing I, I didn't struggle with was as I began to see some of the evidence in nature and, and the history of biology. That, uh, certain things that maybe didn't fit as obviously into a certain ways of interpreting Genesis, that wasn't a huge f 
faith struggle for me uh, because uh, by that time I was in college. I was uh, taking a lot of literature courses. I was at a Christian university. I actually had some good uh, nowadays, you know, you talk about going to a Christian university doesn't necessarily mean that your professors are going to be uh, helpful for your faith, unfortunately. Uh, but one of the things that, that I found helpful is I was uh, taking what I was learning about literature and, and how uh, poetry and that sort of thing work and seeing some things in the Bible, realizing that the Bible uh, uses uh, poetry and that sort of thing. And I wasn't one of these people that, oh, Genesis is poetry, so none of it's literal. Uh, I didn't go down that path uh, because so much of Genesis really strikes me as, you know, as God's tell- really giving us some facts uh, about life. But I, there was a flexibility uh, as I came to some of the particulars in Genesis. So for me, it wasn't a make or break faith issue, for instance, whether the earth was 6,000 years old or much longer. You know, I, I saw, oh, I could see how. Um, a particular reading of Genesis, you know, might account for for either possibility. So it wasn't a real uh, concern of mine, uh, and even the possibility that evolution was true wasn't a big concern of mine. I, one of the reasons for that was I had a, a brother-in-law who was a, a medical. Uh, he, he was in med school. He, he was really committed to mission work. He's very faithful Christian, and he himself, as he was exploring and wrestling with uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, he had some professors that said, you know what, God wanted to do it that way, he could have done it that way. And so he actually started exploring evolution with a pretty open mind. He's like, you know, I know, I believe God did it, but maybe he used evolution. Well, as he dug uh, further and further into it with an open mind, he didn't really have an axe to grind. He wasn't going to try to go into being a PhD in biology where there would have been enormous pressure for him to accept uh, the kind of full Darwinian story. He was going into med school. There might have been a little pressure, but he just kind of went in with an open mind. And he, but as he explored it, he he came to to realize that the the case for blind, unguided evolution of all life was extraordinarily weak, and that there was a lot of bluffing uh, involved. And so he 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 recommended a couple of books to me, and I read those, uh, and that started my journey of being quite skeptical of modern evolutionary theory, even if there are certain elements of it. Yeah, polar bears probably did evolve from brown bears, uh, microevolution. Uh, but the big picture of mindless, unguided evolution, microbe demand, uh, it just, uh, for me, it fell apart on the evidence. Uh, so mm-hmm. while that wasn't a make or break issue for my faith, once I saw that evolution had failed, it actually became another source of strength for my faith because if evolutionary theory fails, you really you're out of you're out of luck as an atheist. Uh, Richard Dawkins, the famous evolutionary biologist, uh, public atheist, he he put it this way once: uh, Darwin and his theory of evolution made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. I think mm-hmm. he was exaggerating, uh, but his point is: you need evolutionary theory to be a an atheist that can in any way kind of have a leg to stand on because you've got to explain the extraordinary uh, intricacy uh, of the the living world uh, of animals mm-hmm. and plants, of the molecular machine you were discovering in cells. You've got to have some other explanation than a designer. And if that, if that fails, there's really no other game in town other than a creator. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so anyway, so I was a, a professor for a while and eventually started working for the Discovery Institute where it's kind of the hub of the intelligent design movement. And so that's allowed me to bring both a kind of a literary aesthetic because my focus was literature, aesthetics, that sort of thing. And then, of course, working at the Discovery Institute in intelligent design, helping edit books, co-author some books. I'm rubbing shoulders with some brilliant scientists. So I had this rare opportunity to be very cross-disciplinary. So that's, that's been really exciting. Yeah, and that's really one of the uniquenesses of, of this conversation and of the book that we want to talk about is just um, how close and how intertwined those worlds are, uh, particularly the world of literature, the world of, uh, of the humanities, the world of history, the world of theology, and how those and the natural sciences are actually deeply, deeply woven together. And that's one of the things that uh, drew me for this conversation and to this particular work of yours 
but before we get into that, uh, well, maybe it's related to that. Uh, one of the things you say early on in the book is that this book that you've written, A Meaningful World, um, and we'll get to the subtitle in just a second, but you describe it as an antidote. And you mentioned a couple of uh, the big names in science that really seem to have dominated the conversation for somewhere around 100 to 150 years, starting with Darwin uh, and then uh, the presence of Sigmund Freud in the early part of the 20th century. And now this group rec- represented by Richard Dawkins, sometimes referred to, oftentimes referred to as the new atheists, who really came into prominence, uh, triggered in some way possibly by the events of 9-11 in 2001. And then you had the, the kind of meteoric rise of uh, the voices of these atheistic scientists of Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Peter Singer, mm-hmm. uh, a number of others who became very aggressive, very militant in their uh, approach of atheistic materialism, naturalism. Um, uh, I think it was Christopher Hitchens who went so far as to say that religion is a virus on the uh, hardware of humanity and that needs to be eradicated. Uh, We've talked about that some here at the Denison Forum. Um, But it really does, you, you can see it in popular culture, you can see it in movies. You can see it in other aspects of culture. That it's almost a given that from Darwin to Dawkins, they're, they've been largely unquestioned uh, in a lot of ways for around a hundred or so years in our culture. Why do you think that is? How do you think we got to that kind of milieu that we're operating in today? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. It's a very complex question. I think there are a lot of threads. I would say that Darwin's theory of evolution, uh, while it falls apart on close scrutiny, it was maybe the first to offer at least a superficially plausible explanation for the origin of you know all these amazing plants and animals we have around us that that didn't invoke uh, a, a creator. And there were forces already in place in Western society that that were eager to move toward a atheistic or at least agnostic. Uh, point of view culturally. Um, Huxley, he formed the X Club, uh, a friend of Darwin's. Uh, he, he wasn't even fully convinced by Darwin's theory. He thought natural selection was too restrictive. If you had to, if you had to build things using natural selection, he, he didn't see how it would work. But he, he hmm. didn't see any other game in town. He, and he had this program of wanting to move culture away from uh, Judeo-Christian religion kind of free it, you know, of the shackles of religion. And so he glommed on to Darwin's theory, even though he, he didn't see it as completely credible and became a very effective uh, proponent of it. He was called Darwin's bulldog, uh, famously. He was, a, he was a pretty effective debater. Uh, and so I think there were just a lot of forces that wanted something like that. And then, you know, how did, how did they kind of march through the institutions? That's, uh, I think it was in, uh, Antonio Gramsci. I may be misremembering his name, but he was a a Frankfurt School uh, Marxist who talked about the need uh, to move through the institutions of Western culture rather than just say, oh, let's try to take over the, the government. He said, you need to move through the universities. You need to move through the, even if you can get into the seminaries, do that. And so that's been there, a very aggressive program. And and to some degree, maybe Christians were kind of asleep at the wheel. We we wanted to, you know, baptize people. We wanted to, you know, convert people. We want we wanted to tell people about Jesus, which is absolutely crucial, and important. But you know, I think too many of us have forgot that that I think it was Kuiper, Abraham Kuiper, that said, "There's not one square inch of all of creation about which God does not cry mine." Mm-hmm. Uh, and so um, I think there's, there's been a wake up call. For Christians and other other theists of, of of goodwill, that we need to be more proactive about uh, culture generally. You know, what, you know, do we have Christians in Hollywood? Do we have Christians writing novels? Do we have uh, Christians that aren't just running for office, but are uh, you know trying to shape how how we think about uh, politics and political economy? Um, and so, I think that's the good news. I think I think there's kind of a wake up call. Uh, that we need to be proactive across culture. We need to be salt and light in in many areas, and not just inside the church building. Yeah, and it's yeah. I mean, even just yesterday, I sat down after work with my wife, and she started reading to me uh, the testimony of a popular Hollywood figure 
uh, someone that everybody would recognize and started uh, sharing the story of his faith that was published in a recent magazine and just uh, becoming aware that there is no environment um, where Christians are excluded or should be excluded. And uh, as you said, a great wake-up call. Um, I'd like to uh, also ask you to comment just uh, reframing history a little bit. Um, like I said, if you if you know Dawkins coming in the uh, latter half, particularly in his influence uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. But if you take a longer look, um, I had a part of my conversation with your colleague, Stephen Meyer, about this, that uh, really the modern scientific movement, even the scientific method that is so uh, predominant in the fields of science today. If you go back 500 years, you find out that you know, the modern scientific movement that started around the 1500s was actually initiated by very, uh, very dedicated Christian people who were wanting to discover more about the majesty of God through what God has created and what God has uh, enabled us to discover. Can you kind of reframe that conversation of history and remind us of that? Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's a, just a, a wonderful uh, story. And, uh, I, I, there was a period where I was working for another think tank that has has some overlap with Discovery Institute, and we did a documentary called "The Birth of Freedom" uh, that talked about the Judeo Christian influence on the rise of um, the good things in Western culture. Obviously, since Western civilization is run by humans and humans are fallen sinners, there's been all kinds of atrocities. But if you compare Western civilization, you know its rise compared to every other major civilization in history. You know, they would get they uh, did amazing things, uh, and the birth of science is one of the things we cover there. Uh, and uh, so, that I would recommend that as a as a good introduction. If you're like, ah, I don't have time to read a book, well, the birth of freedom. It also looks at the rise of of representative government, uh, the rise of, of economic freedom, uh, and how many people that's managed to lift out of poverty globally. Um, but yeah, those guys, they. Uh, to a man, they were Christians. There might have been some that were, you know, kind of theists. Uh, maybe not like Newton. May have been not a, a completely orthodox Trinitarian. But but to a man, they were all theists who believed in a uh, rational, uh, loving God uh, who created the world, and humans were made in His image. And so that those those two things combined meant, hey, we could we could go and study nature carefully and uncover. The hidden depths. We talk about uh, nature being a work of genius in our book, A Meaningful World. And we say that there's these different qualities. I'm getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but, but one of those is depth. There's a depth to any work of genius. You don't just, you know, read uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet once. Oh, I got it all. Uh, or go to a really great deep uh, film. Oh, I got it all in the first try. Uh, mm-hmm. No, you know, there's depths and depths and layers and layers to it. Uh, they saw nature as a work of supreme genius, so they expected there to be hidden depths, uh, mysterious things that w- wouldn't immediately reveal themselves to them, but because they're made in the image of the creator, they thought, hey, if we study it carefully, maybe we can uncover the, uh, some of that hidden order. They also believe that God, because he's rational, that maybe there's a hidden elegance there. And so um, Kepler, he, he was uh, one of the famous early astronomers who who one of his discoveries, you know, pretty much since the case for a, a heliocentric model uh, of, of the solar system. For a long time, you know, practically everybody thought the sun went around the earth and everything went around the earth. Uh, but, you know, Copernicus first and Galileo argued, no, the sun's at the center of the solar system. And Kepler, he came up with these three laws of planetary motion. Uh, and he, he seized upon the, the ellipses as the shape of the rotation instead of a perfect circle. Some people say, well, the ellipses, that's kind of messy. That's not as elegant as a perfect circle. But he stumbled and he was searching for it upon this very elegant mathematical formula to describe uh, the, those orbits. And he, and he said, and this is a paraphrase, when he, when he made this discovery, I was thinking God's thoughts after him. Hmm. And so what, what is he talking about? He's thinking God. Well, he thought of God as a mathematician. He thought God, there would be an elegance to God's creation. You know, you look out with your eyes and you see a lot of messiness, death and decay and, and um, you know, manure turns into soil and worms going. There's a lot of messy stuff. But he said, there's got to also be 
uh, in addition to all that complexity and depth, I'm thinking there's probably some some hidden elegance there, some some order. If if we can do mathematics as humans, think how how much more of a mathematician God is. So they went looking for that hidden mathematical order, and they found it. So that's one of the spectacular stories uh, of the history of science. And it, and it flips on its head the 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 kind of modern myth that Christianity is somehow opposed to science. Mm. Christianity is the is the is the soil in which science was born. Right, and that that. Christianity in particular has no fear of science. It actually celebrates it, as you said, because right. it's the, the discovery of God, the thinking of God's thoughts after him. And uh, to see that thread, uh, it's, to me, it's just really the importance of a larger, better reading of history it rather is. than uh, kind of the soundbite type approach that we take to so many things in our world today. And, and it really gave the foothold to the new atheists, to the Dawkins and the Hitchens of the world, um, to really mischaracterize faith broadly and Christianity specifically. But but let's go back a little bit to the yeah, title our, just, of the just quick to kind of put a knot on that. Our quarrel isn't with science; it's a ser- that's a search for truth about the natural world. Mm-hmm. Our quarrel is with scientism, uh, which mm-hmm. is this philosophy that dresses itself up as just truth seeking. Uh, science, but it's really a philosophy. It's an atheistic, materialistic philosophy posing as objective uh, search for truth about nature. Would you, um, yeah, thanks for bringing up that term. That's a, that's an impo- important term in this conversation and a distinction that people need to be aware of, the difference between legitimate science and scientific pursuit and that of scientism as uh, what he might even be described, or would you describe it as uh, a false religion, an idolatry uh, in the context of a exactly. Christian terminology? Exactly. Would you, yeah. Would you put it in those con in that context? Yeah, because it's not just a a, a way of kind of looking at the world. It, it does. It is a substitute religion. You think uh, science is going to solve everything, uh, and it's not just any kind of science. It's science uh, yoked to materialism to this idea that ultimately all there is is matter and energy. Your soul isn't real. The idea uh, of an immaterial creator isn't real. Uh, love, uh, that's just glands, chemistry. There, there's not anything authentic there. Good and evil, those are just constructs. Uh, so scientism has a, uh, has a materialistic, uh, philosophical, ideological substructure, and, and it's a substitute religion. Let me let me get you to chase a rabbit with me on that topic for just a second, and that is: Do you think that uh, the the shared experience that we all had over the last three three and a half years relative to COVID and the COVID pandemic, um, you know, there was oftentimes this um, this clarion call and then criticism of, "Well, just trust the science, just trust the science." Um, do you think? The uh, ideology of scientism has taken a hit and a step backward uh, because of the journey through the pandemic, and that you know the world was grappling with something that we had long talked about as a possibility, but now it was upon us, and science couldn't readily and quickly explain it and solve it. Uh, do you think that's kind of hurt the movement of scientism or affected it in any way? I hope that it has caused a lot of people to to realize just because somebody in a white lab coat or the head of some, you know, scientific branch of government says, science says that what is really happening is a particular fallible human being is saying, here's what I think. And rather than look carefully lay out the evidence in front of you, I'm going to make a appeal to authority. Uh, and uh, that that should raise our uh, um, baloney detector. Uh, you know, why is you know why is he making this questionable appeal to authority if he can just trot out really powerful evidence for what, you know, for what he's saying? Uh, hmm. and so yeah, we we saw a lot of flip flopping uh, that I think it should be educational that that we need to be uh, not be led around by the nose by somebody just claiming scientific authority. Right, and one of the one of the healthy signs of a healthy person and, and a healthy scientist, for that matter, would be someone who says that it's okay to say I don't know. They're right. They're just we're 
uh, times when all scientists need to be able to say that with the proper kind of humility and especially when something of a of the nature of a hopefully once in a lifetime once in a millennium global pandemic that we can say you know what there was just a lot we didn't know and now we know a lot more but we don't know everything that we would like to know and that's that's always the journey of of what right. of what life and science is all about Let, let's go back to the book a minute the book is titled a meaningful world and then the subtitle how the arts and science reveal the genius of nature give us the backstory of what prompted you to write this book in the first place Great question. I was working, by then I was working at the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. That's the hub of the intelligent design movement. Uh, and so that's some important context because the theory of intelligent design, uh, in a nutshell, it says that there are things in nature uh, that c- carry a clear mark of having been created by a designing intelligence. In other words, they didn't happen by some law-like you know, ma- magnetism or or something random like floods or earthquakes or tornadoes. That there, there was a, a planning, forethinking uh, designer at work uh, putting that together. So certain things in nature it could be the the, the molecular um, outboard motor we call the bacterial flagellum uh, that uh, Michael B makes a, a really powerful argument. It has the the earmark of design. It could be the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of, of physics and chemistry for life. Um, that's a, such a problem for atheists that the, the name for that issue in physics is the fine-tuning problem. Uh, they just call it the fine-tuning. Well, it's not a problem to a theist, uh, but to some people it's a problem because <laughs> why would these? Why would gravity and all these other be just right to allow for stars and planets to form and, and uh, hundreds of other ways? Uh, Steve Meyer probably got into that a little bit uh, so, when you talk to him. You can you know find his stuff online or get his book, The Return of the God Hypothesis. He goes into depth about that. Uh, and many Nobel laureates have said fine tuning points to a designer. So so intelligence, right? Uh, that's that's where where ID kind of stops. Says, look, there there's a designing intelligence. But we said uh, Ben Weicker and I uh, said, you know. We don't just have a uniform experience of what intelligent agents can do and can't do and what, and what an intelligent agent can do beyond what, say, a tornado can do. We have uniform and a rich experience of what geniuses can do, you know, a higher form of intelligence. And since I had a background in the arts and Ben Weicker had some background in that as well as uh, he was, he's also a, a kind of jack of all trades, uh, shameless generals like myself. Uh, we said let's 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 look at some of the iconic works of genius in you know Western civilization, see if we find some common uh, themes, characteristics, and then see go back into nature and see if we find those. And mm-hmm. so and so so we did. Uh, we found you know some common characteristics. We we boiled it down to four, and then we show how whether you're looking at chemistry, we're looking at at cosmology, whether you're looking at biology, we find these characteristics of genius. So we kind of took it to the next level, if you will, took the intelligent design argument to the next level. Should Christians boycott? Is Christian nationalism biblical? Should Christians send their kids to public school? We tackled these questions and seven more in our latest volume of Biblical Insight to Tough Questions. Support the mission of Denison Forum and request our new book today at dfpodcast.org. Let's go down a couple of those roads because just to kind of give people a framework of what this this book and this conversation is about, it's it it might be expected by people to say how science reveals the genius of nature, but the combination of art and science as the the revelation of genius of of this higher level of of learning that points to the ultimate level of knowledge and understanding that we would find and place in God. Um, and, and let me just kind of set a little bit of a framework for this part of our, our conversation is this, uh, it, it just kind of startled me when, uh, I, when I went from the title into the first part of the book and the, the whole discussion about how Hamlet as this exquisite piece of literature actually 
more, I think the book quotes uh, what you say in there is, Hamlet has been more studied than any other piece of literature except for the Bible. That's um, right. Yeah, it's, it's and, extraordinary which how is much. A, yeah, it is extraordinary for me just to hear that. Um, and But just to go back in and, and to say, okay, as an expression of something that we find in the world and in, uh, and in the human endeavor, uh, to find something of this quality of this magnitude and of this, uh, as you said, depth and exquisite nature, how does that point us and reveal these principles of genius that point ultimately back to God? Yeah, that's so when we we use Shakespeare, you know, we could have gone to lots of different places as examples, but, you know, we, we had to get it all in one book. And so we mainly focused on a couple of plays by Shakespeare and then just kind of briefly you know, pointed to some other works of genius that that also illustrated these points. But Hamlet's where we start, and and we show it, it illustrating these four characteristics that we boil down of, of genius. There's uh, works of genius have a depth to them. You don't just you know read you know read it once or or go um, you know look at a, a, an amazing genius uh, painting and just oh yeah I get it I'm done. Um, there's layers and layers. Uh, of meaning and beauty there that if you, if you keep studying it, uh, there's a harmony to it. Uh, harmony involves uh, the artful relationship among a variety of parts, uh, a diversity brought into happy association, if you will. We, um, the, the easiest example is, is musical harmony. You know, when you get mm-hmm. four different parts and they're all blending together, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful thing. When they don't blend together, it's, you know, a scary thing. Um, mm. The uh, then in in Shakespeare, you know, what what does a play by Shakespeare have to do with harmony? Well, he brings these very disparate elements into harmony. He, there's comic elements in in Hamlet. There's and of course tra- it's a tragedy, so as you expect, there's tragic uh, elements. There's elevated language. There's very earthy uh, language, you know, sometimes even body. Uh, but these elements are not just oh, I'm getting tired of the the dark parts. Let's have some fun. Oh, well, let's go over here and have a little body. Oh, let's have some elevated language. Those different aspects, they interpenetrate, they strengthen each other. Uh, it's you know kind of a two plus two is five kind of thing. So there's this rich harmony there. Uh, then the elegance, uh, there's an elegance uh, in the play, and I won't go into depth there, but you, you can see elegance in you know, certain types of, of poems where, where the, the rhyme scheme just neat, fits neatly together. You know, in nature, we see elegance, and I've already kind of alluded to this with Kepler's three laws of motion. Everybody's familiar, even if you know not one in a hundred people understand it. With with Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity, E equals m c squared. I mean, isn't it extraordinary that there's this far-reaching, uh, probing uh, insight into um, physics that can be so c- compactly expressed? So, elegance. Um, you know, it's it's the emphasis there on bringing uh, a, of a unity out of something complicated. Uh, so we see that in Shakespeare. Uh, we saw, we also see um, clarity, uh, and clarity uh, isn't like newspaper, like a good newspaper. It's very clear and easy to read. That's not what we mean by clarity. Uh, clarity comes from the Latin claris. It means bright, shining, illustrious, evident. Let me give an example that probably most people on this. Uh, radio show are familiar with the 23rd Psalm by David. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, you know, et cetera, et cetera. This beautiful Psalm. Well, why did he have, use all these metaphors? And, you know, that's, and it's going to be hard for like a 10 year old kid to get it because he, you know, doesn't know about shepherding and, and metaphors can throw him off. Why didn't he say, why didn't David say, the Lord takes good care of me? He won't. Uh, he'll give me everything I need, uh, water and other stuff. Uh, he'll always be there for me, even in tough times. Uh, that's clear. Uh, well, it's clear, but there's no radiance to it. There's, there's no the power, uh, the the shining, illustrious quality is gone from it. Uh, and so, works of genius have that that clarity, that radiance about them. So then we took the, we took those those four depth clarity harmony elegance, and we said okay now let's turn to nature, and find those. Uh, and of course I've already mentioned how the the founders of science 
they expected depth. They expected elegance. And they went and found them. Another great example is this, uh, this Russian chemist from the 19th century, uh, Mendeleev. He, they, they were starting to build the periodic table of elements that you know, probably gave a lot of us uh, nightmares when we were forced to <laughs> yes. forced to learn it, and others dreams, and you know, fell in love with it. The, the few of us yeah. that, that really got into chemistry, uh, I can still see it. I can still yeah. see it on the wall of my seventh yeah. grade chemistry yeah. class. Yeah. <laughs> For some of us, no. Um, but once you start to get it, even if you don't get all the the, the depths of it, it's like wow. There's the, the, there's a there's an order. There's a pattern to it. You know, the, the, those columns aren't just kind of random. Oh, let's put them all up here, and we got to put it on a poster and so we'll kind of put make it rectangular you notice how it's not quite everything's even well those columns mm-hmm. the, the the elements in those columns tend to share characteristics i mean they're each distinct they share characteristics and what mendeleev did is somebody f- before him uh, john newlands said i wonder if there's a pattern uh, an octave pattern like every eighth uh element repeats and, ha- and has something in common maybe mm-hmm. but then it didn't quite fit and ah, never mind i give up on that but Mendeleev, who was a theist, believed in a, a, a wise creator, he said, no, I, I think there's something here. I think there's a, there is a pattern. I, I think this law of octaves may be real. And so he stuck to his guns and he said, you know what? If this law of octaves is real, there should, should be an element here that's missing that we haven't found yet. And over here, there should be one that's missing that should fit in this column. Which is, what, how did, how's that doing science? It's it's kind of weird. It's not usually like, oh, it's totally uh, you gather evidence and you experiment and you and you have observations and then you come to conclusions. Well, he was doing some of that, but he also had this idea that God, the creator of the of the periodic table elements, was an orderly God, and there had to be some hidden order. And he stuck to his guns, and because of that, they started they started turning up the missing elements, uh, gallium. In 1875 was the first thing it fit. It was like a puzzle. It fit right in where he predicted it would be. Uh, so that's just one of many examples of how um, scientists seeing nature as a work of genius went out, had that framework, and it helped them do science better. So we go through the book and look at uh, different areas and look at that, whether it's depth, harmony, uh, and, and that's since we've written it. We could do it. We could do it afterwards now, particularly in biology. Where we said we we thought we'd given you a good taste of the depths of biology and biochemistry, we were just getting warmed up because of the last fifteen years. They're discovering things like uh, in in DNA, you get stretch of the DNA, and you can uh, move it over uh, to a different slightly different reading frame, and it'll create another. It'll have, have some other function, uh, mm-hmm. or, or and you can read it backwards and forwards, and it'll have two different functions. Uh, so um, imagine a written human code that, oh, I've read it front ways. Now I'm going to read this section backwards. And oh, it has a really important meaning too. And, uh, mm. Or software that did that sort of thing. So it's just, just off the charts, ingenious stuff that they're, they're discovering. Yeah. So let me, let me get you to uh, define a couple of terms. And then I, I, I got another question okay. for you. But just, just so I know that I'm on the same page with you, uh, give, me the, give me the working definition of how you're using the word genius. Yeah, genius would be artistic genius. Well, genius would just be is loosely termed as somebody that's really brilliant, uh, but it really has a little bit more formal definition in bo- both when you think of artistic genius and scientific genius of doing something deeply original as well as de- extremely difficult and that requires a lot of intelligence. So you might have somebody that's brilliant, uh, but if they're not creating something new, they're not having a breakthrough. In the stricter sense of the word genius, you wouldn't, you know, call them a genius. So Einstein was a right. genius because he had this extraordinary breakthrough. There might be somebody with a, a higher IQ that could score a little higher on an IQ test uh, than Einstein, but that IQ test wouldn't make him a genius in this narrower sense of the word. It would be these uh, people that have this ability to make these great creative leaps. Uh, so you know, Shakespeare is a genius because of the the creative uh, just distinct way that he he did his plays but then of course there was also a greatness to the artistry it wasn't just that they were di- different distinct fresh yeah. um, okay so if i if i follow you correctly then these qualities the particularly these four qualities yeah. of genius uh as we find them reflected in in any part of our created world 
uh, become reflections of of God as the ultimate genius. Yeah, the ultimate genius. Um, yes, and, and, and they, yeah, and, and they help, and they also help us grapple with some things because when you you approach a work of genius, if you, you do it with the right mindset, like when I first came to Shakespeare in high school, I didn't get all that. The, the language is four hundred years old. Right. Um, it's like being thrown on a black diamond ski slope and. Hey, is this fun? You know, and you're you're you've never skied before. No, it's not yeah. fun. It's scary and weird, and I don't know what's going on. Uh, no. for, for a lot of us, that's our experience of Shakespeare in high school. They we dip in two or three weeks, assume that kids can pick up you know 400 year old English, and if not, they're stupid. Which no, it's it's almost a foreign language at this point. Um, but if you stick with it, and you have okay, surely all these people down to the ages that have found uh, this amazing depths and riches in Shakespeare. Uh, if I stick with it and, you know, you have some aptitude, some people, you know, are b- b- good at different things, right. uh, then you're, you're going to uncover some, some amazing stuff there and it's going to start clicking and you're going to, uh, you're going to go, Oh, I see why he did this or, or, or you know, wh- why he didn't just use the simpler way of saying this. Or when you come to, you know, poetry in the Bible, Oh, I see why all this poetic language that made me scratch my head at first. Uh, I see now what, what the, what the writer was up to. So you bring that patience, that humility to the work, and it can make all the difference. It's the same with when we come to nature. Um, you know, like, why does the earth have to have earthquakes? You know, if God were a loving, good God, he wouldn't have any earthquakes. Well, hmm. maybe, but maybe God has purposes and reasons that we don't know about. And scientists, by the way, have discovered some purposes. We can circle back to that in a little bit if you want. Purposes for our active geology that, that leads to earthquakes. Um, right. And then there's theological answers to that too. You know, why, why doesn't God make our lives completely free of suffering and, and challenges? You know, would that really be good for us uh, fallen creatures? I mean, there's, probably, there's a reason he had Adam and Eve leave the, the Garden of Eden after they sinned. It wasn't just because right. he was grumpy at them. Uh, he knew that having everything, you know, e- easy straight for people that were fallen and sinful was not what was best for them. Uh, hmm. Oh, I digress a little bit, but but well, when you no, when you great. but when you when you think, hey, this is a genius, I need to approach it humbly, uh, and, uh, rather than I'm smarter and better and wiser, and well, what's this idiot doing? Uh, bring that humility to it. You're going to learn more. You're going to discover things. It's just it's going to be a more joyful, interesting journey. Right, and and as a process of revelation, I just you know it's hard to have this conversation not be from my chair thinking about Romans one and what Romans one tells us about the 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 reality of God being revealed on so many all levels of life, and that the reality of it is is that we're bumping into expressions and reflections of God's genius all the time, um, yeah, even without we, science. And, and we may not appreciate them. And, I, and as you are kind of walking through these qualities, it makes me think along these lines of, you know, when you read a great novel or you see a great work of film, you know, I, I think of a couple of Stephen King films <laughs> that come to mind, actually, when I think about depth and I'm like, oh, wow, you know, if, if I go back and think about that movie again, or I think about that novel again, or I go back and watch that movie again, I'm like, oh, I didn't see that before. And that that idea of depth and layer is in there as it pertains to a great story. Um, if you if you talk talk about harmony and, and as you as like you said, we probably almost resonate with that one quickly because of well, we know when a piece of music is not done in harmony, it's painful to our ears, and. We're like, oh, that's just that's just not good music. I just I just don't want to be around that. That's not good music. It doesn't sound right because we have this internal sense of what harmony and and uh, uh, the intersection of of harmony might look like. Uh, clarity. Uh, your example about the twenty third Psalm is is really helpful. I got to tell you, the Doctor Witt, the one I'm struggling with a little bit is elegance. Is wrapping my my understanding around this quality of elegance. Um, uh, right. mm-hmm. as an expression of beauty, as an expression of genius. Can you unpack that one just a little bit more for me? Is it simply unity or is it more than unity? Yeah, that was when, when we formulated these, I was struggling a little bit. How do we distinguish harmony and elegance? Because they're so closely related. I finally you know, told Ben, I think they're really two, they're two you're coming at the same thing from two different angles, and it's kind of the, the emphasis is more. 
So elegance is, is a type of harmony, but the, the emphasis is on a very compact unity uh, among a diversity. So, you know, I gave the, the example of, you know, you've got all these planets coming around uh, the sun, right? And they've got, got different orbits and some are out far and near and they're not all exactly uh, on the same plane, though they're very close to the same plane, interestingly. Uh, but then Kepler comes up with this, this, these laws, these three very elegant laws that describe all that diversity. And so that would be an example of elegance. Mm-hmm. Um, we see in nature, are you familiar with the, the uh, Fibonacci number? Uh, yes, it's, a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. it, the, there's this Fibonacci number. Um, the number is, I can't remember how, it's like uh, you get it by adding the last two numbers. One plus two is three. Uh, two plus three is five. Uh, three plus five is eight. Anyway, then there's this number that comes out of that, a ratio. And we see that the, go- the golden rectangle uses the Fibonacci uh, number. We see spirals all through nature that, that use this Fibonacci number, the, the, the shell of a nautilus, uh, the spiral of galaxies, uh, the number of seeds in, um, in sunflowers. Uh, hmm. they, they might, they might, they'll have a Fibonacci number. It might be, you know, one or it might be a bigger sunflower, but it's always going to have this Fibonacci number, uh, tip, or almost always. There's hundreds of examples. So that would be an answer, an example of elegance in nature where, wow, all of a sudden there's this, this Fibonacci number cropping up, uh, all over nature. Uh, Eugene Wigner, uh, he was a, a scientist and thinker and he, he talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. For the natural sciences, <laughs> and that's just like the the fine tuning problem. It's only unreasonable if there's if there's not a god in heaven, if there's not a creator. But if God, if the creator God is a master mathematician, and when he was creating this elegant universe, and there's a documentary by the way called The Elegant Universe. I don't mm-hmm. think the people that made it were believers, uh, but they, they they see the elegance in, in nature. Uh, so so you find that that mathematical elegance cropping up all over the place. So talk about that. I'm glad you brought up math because I'm. I just I'm sitting here imagining, you know, my uh, my young granddaughter learning uh, learning her numbers and eventually learning her uh, mathematical or multiplication tables and ultimately long division. I'm thinking about that kid that's encountering algebra or calculus for the first time. Um, uh, have had some exposure to the English. Um, uh, Professor John Lennox, uh, who is a world-renowned mathematician, it, it seems like so many things come back to um, uh, the beauty and genius that is revealed in mathematics, and so many things, even theologically, that come back to uh, a connection to and even an anchoring within mathematics. And if you, you know, uh, to the person, the average person that may be listening to this, if you've ever had that joy of uh, Balancing and reconciling your checkbook and <laughs> doing that regularly and having some problems with it and then figuring it out and the joy that comes through that. Yeah. Or if you're an accountant um, and you've ever drafted a budget for a company and then the, that budget actually worked itself out in, in real time and in real business and then you were able to reconcile that, that you're touching on some of the genius of mathematics, not to mention the connection between mathematics and something like music. Um, but can you touch, up, touch upon how these qualities of genius particularly express themselves mathematically, not only what you were just talking about, but perhaps in other ways as well? Well, we, let, let me back up a minute. I thought of an example of elegance in biology. We all, biology okay. is often so yep. sophisticated and complex, we, we don't say elegance isn't usually the term. It's like dizzying sophistication or something like that. But when Watson and Crick were trying to discover the, the structure of the DNA molecule, they implicitly, even though I don't think either of those guys uh, at the time were, were believers, but they, they inherited this cultural tradition heritage of theistic science that said, look for elegance, look for harmony, look for death. And they would reject as they kept doing the, do these toy models of, uh, of what they thought the, the DNA molecule shaped like and, and kept, you know, comparing it with what little bit of microscopic evidence they were able to glean at the time. And they would reject possibilities that were too kludgy, too inelegant. 
Mm. And when they when they finally hit upon that, they got a, a view of an X-ray crystallography image by uh, a female scientist in another lab. <laughs> That's a different story where, where they misbehaved <laughs> a little bit there. Um, but then, of course, that other lab couldn't couldn't figure it out from that. At least at that moment, they couldn't. Maybe if they'd had longer. Uh, but Watson Crick took it back, and they looked at it. And there was this kind of cross thing, and they came up with. They said, what about a double helix? Like, like, like take a, a, a picture, a ladder that's twisted. Uh, mm. And, and so the, 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 that gives you this double helical structure. It says, what if that was it? And that would also kind of help explain how DNA copies, because the, the, the two parts could, could come apart and then they could attach. And um, it would, of course, be very sophisticated to copy, but at least you know, we'd have the first inkling of how that might be happening. Uh, but it was the elegance of it that 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 was a big part of what caught their attention to say let, let, let's let's double down and and and, and explore that option. Uh, so anyway, uh, but you ask about do you ask about mathematics uh, and music? Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. Well, and, how, and just how mathematics is so much an expression of genius and in multiple right. it, yeah, across so, multiple areas. So yeah, one of my weakest areas in terms of, of expertise is music, but uh, as probably anybody knows who, even if you're not a musician, you know that music theory uh, is just rife with mathematics. Uh, and you know, you get you get the uh, the different octaves by you know, you can take a a, a string that's, you know, uh, wire and you, and you loop it in two and and, and then half it, and you get roughly an octave, and, and that C note, and then a C note later, they sound good together. There's, there's something common about them, uh, and then that's just the tip of the iceberg about how much how how mathematical uh, music theory is. Uh, most people who are really good at music, they just pick it up. They may not even know math, uh, but there's mathematics, you know, richly under that. And of course, chemistry is rife with mathematics. Physics is almost all mathematics uh, at this point. Uh, even you know before Einstein, you know Isaac Newton's uh, his great landmark work was just you know rich in, in mathematical equations, uh, cosmology, mathematics, um, understanding of thermodynamics, uh, the different laws of thermodynamics, which is now helping us understand things like uh, blood flow and and how different things in the body work. One, uh, one book I'd recommend if you're really uh, you're not as into Kind of arts and sciences, but you're like I like uh, biology and and, and the human. There's a book called Your Design Body uh, mm-hmm. that's written by a physician and a systems engineer, and they take oh, wow. a systems engineering perspective to uh, to the body. And there's so much harmony there; it's unbelievable, uh, and in places elegance. But the harmony of these interacting systems, and some of that, uh, some of the breakthroughs in understanding. Uh, how fine tuned the human body goes back to uh, you know it requires a, a mathematical analysis how, how how certain things are being kept in these very narrow ranges uh, some of the chem- the chemicals in our body and why they need to be kept in those narrow ranges so yeah mathematics is indispensable to so many fields of science yeah yeah it just makes me makes me think if you've ever gotten the uh a lab report from your doctor at an annual physical you know how did they come up with these ranges that you know, all these things in your body needed to be within this number and that number. And, right. and when they're not, then they start going looking for causes and, and problems. You yeah, know, and this, just... this book I mentioned, of course, I want you to go out and buy my book. Uh, but if you buy a second <laughs> book, yes. okay, after you bought A Meaningful World by Jonathan Witt and Ben Weicker, uh, take a look if you're interested in human biology at this book, Your Design Body. They, they go through and we take a lot of these for granted. Oh, yeah, my... my uh, phosphate level or, you know, whatever, my iron level's in the right zone. You know, of course it is. No, your body has to be doing all these ingenious things to keep all of those at just the right level. Uh, like mm-hmm. a, even a cell, you think, oh, a cell's got X uh, amount of stuff in, in it and it's got these ratios. Well, on the outside of the cell, the ratios are completely different. So how is mm-hmm. it maintaining this very di- these di- very different ratios that it needs to? You know, ho- homeostasis is the word. Uh, if it loses right. homeostasis, it becomes like its environment. When you become mm. like your environment, you become dead. Uh, mm. You know, when you die, that your body, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. All that hardworking, ingenious stuff that's maintaining ho- homeostasis between uh, the individual cells, all the different uh, organs of the body, that that quits and it mm. starts to, you know, return to room temperature and in a whole lot of other right. ways, like the environment. Uh, right. It's that genius of the, our design bodies that keeps it keeps it going as long as it does. 
just fascinating. Uh, we could, I just feel like we could, I could continue to just ask questions all day long. But uh, as we get ready to wrap up and just kind of think, I want to, I want to go back to what your colleague Stephen Meyer was talking about and what you referenced a little while ago about earthquakes and other things like earthquakes within our experience. Um, uh, Dr. Meyer alluded in our conversation to uh, how uh, we might understand the presence of miracles as they're described in the Bible, as they're described in the life and work of Jesus. And he said, you know, uh, perhaps a better way for us to understand those kinds of things in answer to Dawkins and others would be that uh, if we if we accept the idea of God and then we accept his ability to intervene in his creation, that those expressions of miracle are not really the interruption of uh, physical laws and the way things uh, normally operate. They're actually a, a glimpse of the restoration of them. That when, just for instance, Jesus healed a person, he was not interrupting natural processes as much as he was picturing the resetting of them the way they should ultimately always be, and we would go on to say will be, uh, in uh, the kingdom of God. Um, That's beautiful. Um, talk about that from the standpoint of, okay, how, how is that possibly a reflection and an, and an, an expression or an answer to the presence of things, you know, this common idea of, well, if, if there is a God and if he is a genius and if he is good, then how can he let things like a pandemic, how can he let things like cancer, how can he let things like a hurricane or an earthquake happen? How do we, how might we think about those things uh, yeah. in, a, in a cohesive, reasonable way? Yeah, I think you, you come at it at two levels. One is scientifically, some of the things that have been pointed to is that's pointless. It has no, like earthquakes, that's pointless. Well, it turns out our active geology is crucial to our Earth being livable and habitable over thousands and, and millions of years, uh, mm-hmm. the, the way our, our the plate tectonics, continental shelves uh, re- recirculate things. Um, and there's a, a great book um, called uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think of the wonder of water, uh, mm-hmm. uh, where, where Michael Denton, uh, an Australian uh, geneticist, uh, gets into all the ways that active geology, uh, including water and all the ways water's done help us. So that's one example. You know, you talk about uh, um, Richard Dawkins complain, well, uh, uh, a wise God wouldn't have made the human eye the way it is. It's backwardly wired. And we've got a little, tiny little blind spot in our eye. Most of us aren't even aware of the blind spot. It's so tiny and, and, and um, easy to ignore. Uh, but as it turns out, there's good engineering reasons for the quote unquote backward wiring of the eye that that Dawkins just ignored because he he was so quick to jump on uh, and critique uh, Mm -hmm. the wiring of the eye. It it improves oxygen flow. So it ultimately improves uh, visual acuity. Um, And so, you know, engineers get this very quickly that they know that uh, any any kind of complex system, there's going to be trade-offs. And you you can't have, you know, you can't have the sports car, the best sports car in the world that's also got the most hauling capacity, you know, that you're going to need a pickup for that. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so there's trade-offs. So but he ignores all that and he found something he didn't quite understand and he jumped on it and criticized it. Uh, whereas if he'd said, hmm, maybe there's a reason for that. Now, so that's the scientific, you know, be, be humble. Maybe there's a reason for it. So you get things like, well, what about diseases where little kids, you know, die or they go blind and, you know, that just seems terrible. Uh, and it is. Uh, but then you have to realize you're also asking a theological question when you say, why would a good God allow suffering and pain and death? And some people, unfairly, they ask a theological question, but then they, they won't allow a theological answer. They mm-hmm. won't allow you to say, okay, you're, talking, you're asking about God and his nature. Uh, well, God has revealed himself to us through his word, through his son, Jesus, and he's given us resources to understand why a good God might allow suffering. Uh, it has to do with, and it's not a simple answer, but it has to do with he made uh, free creatures. He made humans free and they fell into sin. There's indications he made angels free and some of them fell. Uh, maybe the, it seems to be the source of Satan and all the mischief he's sowed in the world. Um, uh, he knows our hearts. Uh, I talked about earlier uh, about Adam and Eve being kicked out of the garden. It wasn't just because God was have, huffy because they took some of his fruit off his tree. Uh, he knew that to restore them, 
they had to, to enter into suffering and, and be challenged and be, and be humbled so that he could bless them in a greater way. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but those are theological answers. Of course, there's, you, know, you, you could have many shows you know, probing and plumbing those. My main point here is people that ask good theological questions, they're ones we should all wrestle with and, and concern ourselves with, uh, should though be willing to hear theological answers, should be willing to go to those, that mode of knowledge uh, to, to get answers. And it's, yeah. the, it's that scientism, uh, that false uh, philosophy that asks a theological question says, oh, well, I don't want to hear a theological answer. Hmm. No, they, want to, they want to skip categories at times. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking yeah. science is going to solve everything. And if you can't solve, well, that proves that there's no God. No, that, that, that's not good logic. Right. Uh, Dr. Witt, thank you. It's such a fascinating conversation and such a, an important, uh, insightful, and yes, challenging book, uh, A Meaningful World, How the Arts and Science Reveal the Genius of Nature. Uh, would encourage our audience to pick that up and, and uh, other work that you've done. If they want to track and follow more of what you are doing uh, these days, where can they find you besides the bookstore? Yeah, I would go to uh, discovery.org. That's Discovery Institute. And and you'll see a section for intelligent design. You can go to the fellows there. You'll find my page under under the senior fellows there. Uh, And then, of course, there's a lot of other great material, uh, a lot of other great science. I talked about rubbing shoulders with some brilliant scientists. Uh, It's just been so exciting. Michael B., Jonathan Wells, Steve Meyer, uh, others. So it's just a great resource, discovery.org slash ID. All right, we'll put that in the show notes as well. And uh, just want to thank you, but also thank our audience for uh, being a part of the conversation today. If this has been helpful to you, please rate, review us on your podcast platform and share this with your friends, your family. Uh, it, really a lot for us to think about, a lot for us to learn, and a lot for us to celebrate about the beautiful design and genius of God as it, as it is revealed around us and in us and all around us. And again, Dr. Witt, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mark. 